This is a brief video podcast series in which we look at cranial nerves 1 through 12 and the paths by which they exit through the foramina of the skull. Up to this point, we have covered cranial nerves 1 through 6. We will now look at cranial nerves 7 and 8 with a particular focus on cranial nerve 7. From the internal aspect of the skull, we can see cranial nerves 7 and 8 as they both exit through the internal acoustic meatus. At this point, we lose track of 8, and there's not too much else to be said except for the fact that it would go to the cochlea, to the semicircular canals, and to the saccule and utricle within the petrous portion of the temporal bone, and that is not visible on any of the models we presently have. Cranial nerve 7, on the other hand, we can see the continuation of cranial nerve 7 in this plastic model. This is the portion that would be hidden in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. We see it takes a very strong curve where it starts to run inferior and posterior to emerge through the stylomastoid foramen at the bottom. From here, the main portions of the nerve would continue to supply the muscles of facial expression in this model we have been left with what appears to be the buccal and the marginal mandibular branch. The other ones have been omitted to be able to see the deeper structures. Just briefly on a dry model, you can see the internal acoustic meatus where cranial nerves 7 and 8 would initially go through. We lose sight of cranial nerves 7 and 8 at this portion and do not pick up cranial nerve 7 again until it exits through the stylomastoid foramen. A couple of other branches to be aware of, which we can see in two of our models. First, with the petrous portion of the bone cut away, we would have a portion coming off this region where we see a ganglion known as the geniculate ganglion because of the resemblance that the nerve has to a thigh and a leg and a knee region where the geniculate ganglion is located. It is not well shown in this model, but there would be a branch coming off, continuing down, and eventually entering into the pterygopalatine fossa to enter into the pterygopalatine ganglion. That is the greater petrosal nerve. If we look at the dry sample, we've been able to schematically represent this. If I pull the trigeminal nerve to the side, we can see this gray branch representing the parasympathetics that are associated with the greater petrosal nerve. This is where it reemerges once again in the cranial vault. So this is where it would be running deep, coming off of the facial nerve right at the level of the geniculate ganglion, then re-enters the skull, and here we can see the top portion of the carotid canal, where this nerve would be passing down. We then need to turn the skull over, pick this up from the underside, and as we do, this would be the continuation of the nerve branch here, where it would then go through the nerve, or sorry, the pterygoid canal, or the vidian canal. And in doing so, we can see its close association with the carotid canal through the foramen serum here. This is where sympathetics would jump off of the internal carotid artery as the deep petrosal nerve almost immediately join the greater petrosal nerve, and that forms the nerve of the pterygoid canal, or the vidian nerve, which would then run anteriorly from here, and the vidian canal, or the pterygoid canal then terminates once again into the pterygopalatine fossa. An additional branch to be aware of that is well represented on the plastic model would be actually before we get to that 
once again, here's the pterygopalatine fossa that we see here containing the pterygopalatine ganglion. And although the vidian nerve is not really represented in this, this is where it would terminate. And this is where it would give off branches. We can actually see this in this additional model here. So once again, here is the pterygopalatine fossa. We can see the pterygopalatine ganglion, where the nerve of the pterygoid canal or vidian nerve would terminate its sympathetics and parasympathetics. Some of them would jump up and join the maxillary nerve and then wrap up again off of the zygomatic nerve to join the lacrimal nerve. This is shown better in this plastic model. Here we see the maxillary nerve. So sympathetics and parasympathetics originally from the nerve of the pterygoid canal. We continue along the maxillary nerve through the zygomatic nerve until they would reach this point and then they would jump onto this connecting branch which then would move up and merge with the mat lacrimal nerve running into the lacrimal gland. And once again, on this model here, we can see the infraorbital nerve, which would already have the sympathetics and parasympathetics. And here we can see the connecting branch, which would run up, merge to the lacrimal nerve, which would then go into the lacrimal gland. Now the other branch to be aware of, which we can see quite nicely on this model, is the chordae tympani. This is the nerve branch that comes off of facial just before it exits the stylomastoid foramen. And we can see it right here. This is where it would appear just medial to the tympanic membrane on the outside in the middle ear cavity. It will then continue forward anteriorly through the fissure point of the temporal and occipital bones and reemerges into the infratemporal fossa where it would then merge onto your lingual nerve here. This is also represented in the dry skull model. If we take a look, we have that stylomastoid foramen. If we go just superior to it, we can see the internal acoustic meatus, and inside the internal acoustic meatus, we can see that a second gray wire representing the chordae tympani. We run this anteriorly, and we can observe this fissure located between the temporal and occipital bones, which is where the chordae tympani then emerges to be able to enter into the infratemporal fossa and merge with the, the lingual nerve. This is what's going to carry parasympathetics to the sublingual and submandibular glands, as well as a special sense of taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And finally, same thing once again with this model showing the chordae tympani running anteriorly through the fissure between the temporal and occipital bones, fusing with the lingual nerve.